Good morning, everyone. Um, hope you're doing well. Hope your property is doing well. This was uh, crazy weather. Ever since we got back from uh, Hawaii, it feels like it's just been off and on raining every single day. Um, and uh, I see trees down around our neighborhood. Our back fence is going to have to be replaced uh, at some point. Um, so hopefully you're doing well. Um, welcome to Karis. I was going to announce that we were having our potluck, but I just realized we're not. But we will still have food, so hopefully you can stay afterwards. Um, I do want to open us up with a word of prayer, so let's, let's pray together. Father, it is good to come here to worship together, Lord, as a family, uh, to spend time in your presence, Lord, to hear a word from you, to allow your spirit to speak to our hearts, and we pray that you would do that. Uh, we pray for those, Lord, who are struggling through the, the rain, Lord, through the inclement weather, uh, for people, Lord, uh, in our midst even maybe who are struggling through other things, Lord, I think in life, uh, we all are dealing with things that we often don't share out loud with one another. So I do pray for everyone here and your blessings upon them, Lord, and ask that you would bless our time now. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, there is one announcement that I want to make regarding next week. As many of you know, the slide's already up. We don't have use of these facilities, and so we've decided to once again hold our service at Century Laguna Theaters on Bighorn, where we're going to hold a quick service, if you really want to call it that. I mean, it's like a 10-minute service that I'm going to give. And then we're going to watch the movie Avatar, The Way of Water, together. Uh, you should have received an email with a link via which you can let us know how many seats that you would like to reserve. So if you haven't received that email yet, please make sure to talk to Becky before you go. Uh, we do want to get a head count of the number of people that will be attending. Uh, the doors to the theater are going to open at 9.30. And so if you could come by 9.15, um, we could be there ready to go in. This would allow us to get settled in so that I could share a brief message and then leave enough time for any of you if you would like to go and get refreshments before the movie then starts at 10 o'clock. Okay, the cost of the tickets is covered by the church, so come on out uh, and enjoy a movie with us next week. Okay, that's the only announcement that I have for this week. I'm going to go ahead and transition into my message. Uh, my message this morning brings us to the end of our series on the Enneagram, which is a little bit bittersweet for me because I've really enjoyed digging into the different personality types. And we have been using the Enneagram as an assessment tool in order to help us to better understand some of the deeper layers of our personality with the ultimate aim towards becoming more healthy, becoming more whole, becoming more authentically ourselves and the person that God created us to be, which I believe is the goal of the outworking of our faith to be transformed, to allow the love of God to shine its light into those areas of our lives that are maybe keeping us from experiencing the fullness of life that God desires for us. As I've mentioned a number of times, most other personality typing systems like Myers-Briggs or StrengthsFinder tend to focus on emphasizing your strengths. But as one Enneagram author that I read noted, he said, personality tests tell you who you really are. The Enneagram tells you who you're really not. In other words, uh, what the Enneagram helps you identify in yourself is something that theologians and mystics, and I've referred to here as your shadow side. It is the false self that we all create out of fear, or shame, or anger. Now, our shadow side, to me, is a little bit like an avatar. 
somewhat similar to the movie that we're going to be watching next week. A persona that we construct and present to the world because this constructed self feels better than our real selves. But because our shadow selves were formed in darkness, they live from out of the recesses of our personalities and we're therefore often not even aware of them. And until a light is actually shown into those resource, recesses and we address those shadow sides of our personality, there really is no healing, in my opinion. And I would say there really isn't any authentic spiritual growth. You might be forcing some forms of outward obedience to Christian practices or disciplines, but there's not much change that's happening. Not really. Not on the inside. It's all just window dressing. Until we face down these shadow selves and understand the lies we believed that led us to create them in the first place, we can't really heal. And that is what I believe the Enneagram is very useful in helping us to do. The Apostle John, in the first of his letters, he wrote the following in his opening words. This is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you. God is light and there is no darkness in him at all. So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. But if we are living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The Apostle John often uses the image of light and darkness to describe our relationship to God. And for me, growing up in the church, I had always understood this verse to mean that God is good and he is light. Sin is bad and it is darkness. Therefore, the goal is to quit sinning and through obedience, come into God's light. Now, I'm not saying that there isn't some element of truth to that, but I do believe that there is a different way to understand God or John's message, or maybe a different process through which we come into the light. One of the great truths that I, I don't think we ever really own enough of is the truth that I'm sure we've heard a thousand times that we are created in the image of God. That to me is one of the great truths of scripture and it has ramifications across everything. And I think part of what John is seeking to do is to help us to separate our identity from our actions. To help us to recognize this great truth that often gets obscured by our sin and our brokenness. Sin is darkness. And it will keep us from seeing the truth of who we are. Sin lies to us about our true nature and about the truth of other people as well. This is why Jesus said in John's gospel that he didn't come to condemn the world, but to save us. God's love is what saves us. God has always loved us. He will always love us. And that is another great truth. But sin is going to try to convince you otherwise. Sin convinces us to become angry and to become afraid and ashamed. Sin convinces us to cover up and to hide and to blame. But it's all a lie. And this lie is why we create our shadow self. And opening up ourselves to that part, that part of us, is scary. Because the shadow self is what has kept us safe throughout all, the, all of our lives. Or at least that's what we believe, maybe even without knowing it. But if we can learn to not run from exposing it, to be vulnerable and open, I equate this as coming into the light. 
we allow that deepest part of us to come out into the light or we allow God's light in and let ourselves be seen by God. And when our shadow selves experience that love, that to me is when transformation takes place. Not by our actions, but by God's love. God shows us who we really are. God reveals the lies that have given rise to our shadow selves. It is God's light and love that brings healing to those places that I believe the Enneagram can help us to become aware of. And so, with that said, this brings us to our final Enneagram type, which is type 7. Uh, one book that I read calls type 7s the fun lover. But they're often referred to as the enthusiast or the adventurer. And sometimes as the optimist or the entertaining optimist. Now, like I did with certain other personality types, I'm going to read you a list of 20 descriptors that describe an Enneagram Type 7. And I want you to listen to these and gauge how many of these descriptors you resonate with. Because personally, I believe that in this culture in which we live, sevens tend to be more represented in our population than in other areas around the world. Okay, so listen to these 20 characteristics and just keep count with how many resonate with you. Number one, almost everything can be more fun and entertaining with a little effort. Number two, I don't like to be limited or constrained in any way. Number three, life is better than people imagine. It's all about how you explain things to yourself. Number four, I like people and they usually like me. Number five, I seem to let go of grievances and recover from loss faster than most. Number six, if I'm honest, I struggle with FOMO, which is the fear of missing out. Number seven, I don't like making hard and fast commitments to things. Number eight, it's hard for me to finish things. When I get close to the end of a project, I tend to start thinking of the next one and move on. Number nine, variety and spontaneity are the spice of life. Number 10, when things get too serious for too long, I usually find a way to lighten things up. Number 11, I think people worry more than they should. Number 12, people say that I am an optimistic person. Number 13, I usually avoid heavy conversations and confrontations. Number 14, I like to have many options available to me. Number 15, I'm pretty good at winging it. I can fake it till I make it if I have to. Number 17, or number 16, I am busy and energetic and seldom get bored if left to do what I want. Number 17, I am a jack of all trades. Number 18, it makes me uncomfortable when I have to deal with unpleasant emotions. Number 19, I'm always up for an adventure. And number 20, I love thinking about planning and anticipating the next exciting thing. How many of those characteristics resonated with you? If 12 or more resonated with you, then type 7 might be one of the personality types that you gravi gravitate towards. Enneagram 7s or enthusiasts are typically the most outgoing 
of the personality types on the Enneagram. Like their name suggests, they are enthusiastic and energetic, and they maintain a positive outlook on life, which is why they're sometimes known as the eternal optimists. Type sevens love to engage in new experiences and adventures. They excel at generating new ideas because of their creativity and their ability to think outside of the box. Sevens have wide-ranging interests and they enjoy trying new things. They are spontaneous, fun-loving, and they can make even a trip to the laundromat adventurous and fun. Their enthusiasm is infectious. I mean, if you are going on a family vacation, a type seven is the one that's going to amp up the excitement and the entertainment value of whatever you do. In many ways, sevens bring joy to life if you can keep up with them, which most of us can't. In weeks past, I've used the Enneagram iceberg image that illustrates the different traits of a particular Enneagram type that are visible to those outside versus the underlying emotions within each personality type that is the driving forces behind those traits. For the type seven, what others witness on the outside and see in a type seven are that they are optimistic and fast paced. They are enthusiastic, spontaneous, and are idea focused individuals. This is what others see on the outside. But on the inside, what sevens feel is that they have a desire for new experiences. They are afraid of commitment. They fear pain, they are preoccupied with the future, and again, they have FOMO, the fear of missing out. Now, we will end this series by once again looking at the characters from the movie Encanto, which was the movie that got me to thinking about the Enneagram and how each of the different personality types are reflected in many of the characters from this movie. So who from the movie Encanto do you think represents the type seven in the Madrigal family? Of all the Enneagram types, this one to me wasn't as strongly reflected in any one character. And maybe part of the reason uh, why the evidence isn't as strong is because the character that I believe is a type seven really didn't have a very large role in the movie. I believe the type seven in the Madrigal family is Camille. Camille is the middle child to Peppa, who is one of the three children of Abuela, the matriarch of the movie. His older sister, Dolores, is the one who has super hearing, can hear everything, and that we identified as a type five. And his younger brother is Antonio, who has the gift of relating to animals. Uh, we didn't really place Antonio on the Enneagram, but if we did, I think he is likely a type nine. Camillo has the gift of shape-shifting, meaning that he can appear in the form of another individual and even talk like them so that you can't really tell the difference if it's them or not. As I mentioned, he's not in the movie a lot, and most of the time when he is in a scene, he's the one that provides comic relief. He shapeshifts in order to make fun of other people in somewhat harmless ways, but then he's gone as quickly as he appeared. If you read more details about the family Madrigal that's available online, Camille is known as the entertainer of the family. He enjoys being in the spotlight. He's a great storyteller and he's funny, witty, and easygoing. All of these descriptions can fit within the outward characteristics and behaviors of a typical Enneagram type seven. What we don't see with Camillo is his internal struggles that he has. Almost all the other characters have deep-seated, unresolved emotional tension that's revealed throughout the course of the movie. But we never see that with Camille which is actually another character trait of a type seven. 
You see, even though sevens can be the life of the party and are always on the go, they're always on the lookout for the next big thing to attend or be a part of, and their lives appear to be filled with adventure and fun and just full of exciting things, there is a reason their lives have taken on that kind of frenetic pace. As is the case with every Enneagram type, what's best about their personality is also what's worst about their personality. Their gift is their curse. Scratch the paint on the surface of a type 7 and you'll find underneath is the felt need to avoid pain and the fear of deprivation. Meaning not the fear of not receiving what you need in life. The felt need to avoid pain is one of the distinctive struggles with Enneagram 7s. A deep aversion to feeling unpleasant emotions. Now, no one enjoys feeling frightened or sad or bored or angry or disappointed. But to a 7, the experience of these things can feel intolerable. Which helps to explain much of type 7's behaviors. The primary defense mechanism of the type 7 is rationalization. <clears throat> sevens are spin doctors. They are masters at what people call reframing. In the blink of an eye, they can take a bad situation and recast it in a positive light so as to keep themselves from feeling any negative emotions. But it also serves to keep them from accepting responsibility in their lives. If a seven didn't get a promotion at work, they might just shrug it off by saying, ah, I didn't really want it anyway. Or if their actions or words might have offended someone, then they might say something to the effect of, well, if I didn't say it, someone would have. This habit of reframing things in their mind, taking refuge in their imagination, allows sevens to stay upbeat and to avoid difficult feelings and the associated pain. This helps to explain why sevens are viewed as the eternal optimists. What some people might envy as the power of their positive thinking is actually many times just a part of their defense mechanism. Sevens are hardwired to focus on what makes them feel good. People they like. Interesting ideas to think about. Good food to eat fascinating and exciting things to do and places to visit. They don't necessarily try to think positively. It just happens. And although on a certain level they enjoy solving problems and tackling challenges, if these give rise to unpleasant emotions, then sevens have a tendency to move on, to look forward to what's ahead to whatever new, interesting, and fun thing that they can move on to. This is why sevens always have a tendency to want to keep the atmosphere in the room light. If the mood of a conversation or the atmosphere becomes a little too heavy and se too serious for too long, sevens tend to be the ones to tell a joke or do something funny. One of the most effective methods of avoiding pain is to laugh. Psychologists call it nervous laughter. Again, for sevens, it's all in the attempt to avoid pain. The deadly sin for the Enneagram type 7 is glut gluttony, which can sound confusing at first because normally gluttony is associated with eating too much food. But for the type 7, gluttony isn't about their fondness for food as much as it is a reflection of their compulsion and their need to devour positive experiences and stimulating ideas and material things which could involve food in order to distract them from any painful feelings. Sevens cope with their inner negative emotions by gorging themselves on new and different experiences 
having possessions, jamming their calendars with activities and adventures, and fantasizing about other future exciting possibilities. More is always better in the mindset of sevens. And our society provides a lot of nourishment to feed this hunger, which makes it hard for sevens to ever get off of that hamster wheel because according to the Enneagram, the opposite of gluttony is sobriety. And sobriety for sevens doesn't mean giving up on drinking, but rather it means slowing down, living in the present moment, exercising self-restraint and reining in their restless spirits and minds so that they can become more aware of and in touch with their inner life. Those who study the Enneagram say that in childhood, sevens felt disconnected from the nurturing figure in their home, whether that was the mother or the father or the grandparent or whoever was doing the bulk of the caretaking. For whatever reason, whether it was abuse or neglect or even just moments that left an imprint on the young mind and heart of the child, the message that the young seven picked up is that they couldn't depend on others around them to provide them with the nurture and the care that they needed. And in order to deal with this, sevens gravitated to transitional objects, toys, activities, anything that will keep them busy and that would help to feed the emptiness that they are feeling inside. As a child, sevens longed to hear the message you will be taken care of from the authority figures in their lives, but that need was frustrated. And so you learned to rely on yourself to provide the nurture and the stimulation that you look for in life. Your shadow side falsely believes that it's not okay for you to depend on others for anything. And the great fear of pain and experiencing anything negative causes sevens to react by doing their best to just radiate optimism and reframe anything feeling negative into something that's positive. This fear of pain and the fear of deprivation that they're going to just, that they will, they will lack the basics of life if they don't see to it that they provide for it themselves is what drives the frenetic pace of seven's lives. But always striving to be one step ahead of your fear and your pain by rushing through life from one exciting thing to the next is not a place of thriving. It's a place of survival. When sevens are not content, they're always searching for ways to find fulfillment. They will quickly move on from whatever situation and experience they are in. Unable to slow down, they're always looking out onto the horizon for something new and exciting coming up. But always focusing on future possibilities makes it impossible for sevens to be in the present moment. If I had to choose one character from the Bible that I believe was a type seven, it would be King Solomon, David's son. Solomon was the third king of the unified nation of Israel. But by then, the leadership of the country was already faltering. They saw the power and the accumulation that other kings around them had, and they wanted to be like them. And the only way to accomplish that was through the exploitation of the people. King Solomon was the epitome of such exploitation and accumulation. He accumulated wealth, possessions, women, the most powerful army Israel has ever known, and he did all of this through high taxes and cheap labor. The result of all of this was that people under his rule eventually got fed up. So that by the time his son Rehoboam took power, the people organized a revolt which ended up splitting the kingdom in two and Israel would never be the same again. And the heartache that resulted from that fracture 
would carry on for a millennia and more, even down till this day. Now, not many of us, if any, will ever have the resources available to us that King Solomon did. But remember, for type sevens, it, it's not just about the accumulation of wealth and possessions. Sevens preoccupy themselves through activity and adventure and experiences that distract them from the underlying pain that they struggle with. And it is the shadow side of their personality that needs to come out into the light, as I talked about earlier in this message. The part that sevens run from is the part that needs to be embraced. And I actually feel like I'm pretty familiar with this struggle. As I mentioned at the outset of this series, although I consistently tested out as a nine on just about every Enneagram test that I took, which was about six of them, on three out of the six, type seven came out as my second strongest personality type. And on the other three, it was either third or fourth. So I resonate a lot with the characteristics of a type seven and with the struggles of a type 7. I know what it's like to avoid pain and to instinctually do so by moving on, as they say, by finding something to distract me from it or even picking up and leaving the situation altogether, often rationalizing that decision so that I feel justified about doing it. I've mentioned in the past that uh, I was in counseling, in therapy for a good number of years. And I distinctly remember several messages that my therapist would communicate to me in the course of our sessions from time to time that would become like these anchoring thoughts that would help to keep me centered. One of them was the words, I'm okay, I'm okay. You know, whenever I'd begin to descend into negative thoughts of self-condemnation, these words, I'm okay, I'm okay, would at times help to buoy my spirit and keep me from falling or being dragged down into this rabbit hole of self-hatred. But another one that I remember is that whenever our sessions would touch on something that was emotionally uncomfortable for me, that like sevens, I'd have this tendency to avoid it, to reflexively change the course of the conversation, to move on to something else. And I wasn't even really aware of it. But my therapist at times would put his hand up and say, stay here. Let's talk about this. And over time, it was kind of code but whenever he put his hand up, I knew that it meant, stay here. Don't move on. Don't rationalize. Don't change, change the subject. Don't crack a joke. Stay. And there were times I didn't like it. Got angry. And when I get angry, I just stop talking. I don't say anything. And so there were times in our hour-long session where we would sit there for like 45 minutes and neither of us would say, wouldn't say a thing because he wouldn't let me move on. And through this process, I learned that I have this tendency, like sevens, to avoid negative feelings. And I still do it. But now, I'm aware of it more. I'm aware that I do it. And I've learned it's important to sit in that place because that place has something to say to you. Because that is part of my shadow side that needs to come out into the light to be loved by God. And that may be true for some of you as well. For all of us, it is the shadow side of our personalities that we need to get in touch with that we need to allow God to touch in order to experience the healing that's going to lead us towards authentic growth. 
And as I said earlier, I believe after going through this that the Enneagram is a very helpful tool that can aid us in uncovering that side of ourselves that we might not otherwise be aware of. And so I'm going to end the series with that thought. Let's pray together. Lord, in this culture that we live in, I think the characteristics of a seven are maybe a little more exaggerated here than in other places because of what's so available to us. How much we can gorge ourselves, Lord, on things that medicate us and keep us from feeling the pain inside of our heart, the brokenness that each of us carry. I do think the Enneagram is very valuable, Lord, in, in its way of being able to help us to see these shadow sides to our personality that we might not otherwise know, that we might have been living with for a long time, and how much it has kept us, Lord, from experiencing the freedom and the life that you want us to live and have. And so I pray this has been a time where people have been able to kind of evaluate themselves. I know in many ways it's not a comfortable time because the Enneagram says up front that it's not something that's comfortable. It's something that's a struggle for everyone. Um, but I think it's in the struggle, Lord, that we are going to find the peace and the wholeness that we long, long for in our lives. And so I'm thankful for our time, Lord, and uh, pray that you would bless our time now of communion and, and uh, taking part in the prayer wall. And uh, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.